Some people have made the claim that living at high altitude can bestow remarkable health benefits, including longer lifespan and reduced risk of disease compared to people living at sea level. A number of professional athletes are alleged to train at elevation before events to enhance their athletic performance. And one Olympic gold medal swimmer even sleeps in an altitude chamber to prepare for competition. Is there any science behind these behaviors, or are they just superstition? Find out in this presentation from endalldisease.com. Here we are, the health benefits of elevation. I want to start off by saying I first learned about the health benefits of altitude or elevation from Dr. Raymond Pete in an interview that he did with the Herb Doctors on KMUD radio in Arcata, California. Check that out. It's a great interview. After listening to that, I was fascinated, as you will be after the information presented in this presentation, I'm sure. And uh, I found it relevant to the subject of cancer. So I did my own research on the subject, collected some studies, and wrote a little bit about elevation and altitude also in my book called Cancer, the Metabolic Disease Unraveled. So that's my extent of research. And here is a presentation that I've made based on all of that research. So we're going to start with the claims that altitude or elevation can reduce your risk of disease. And when you look at the scientific evidence, you find that indeed it is true that living at elevation reduces your risk of heart disease and stroke compared to living at sea level. And if you're watching the video now, there are five studies on the screen. If you are listening to this podcast and you want to look at these studies yourself, at the end of this presentation, I will give you a link to the show notes where you can check that out. But for now, I've chosen one of these studies that we're going to go over, and I'm going to read that to you, and you can see the findings for ourselves. This study was published in the journal Circulation in 2009, and it's called Lower Mortality from Coronary Heart Disease and Stroke at Higher Altitudes in Switzerland. And it was conducted by a number of researchers at the University of Zurich at the Institute of Social and Preventive Medicine. So essentially, this study analyzed, it's a massive study, by the way, it included 1.64 million German Swiss residents born in Switzerland, and in total provided 14.5 million person years of data. And so it was conducted on men and women between the ages of 40 and 84, living at altitudes ranging between 259 and 1960 meters elevation. So, and here are the results. This is fascinating. Mortality from coronary heart disease and stroke significantly decreased with increasing altitude. Being born at altitudes higher or lower than the place of residence was associated with lower or higher risk. So as far as the coronary heart disease, every 1,000 meters increase in elevation resulted in a 22% decrease in your risk of coronary heart disease. And for stroke, for every 1,000 meters of elevation, your risk factor for developing stroke is 12% reduced. Here are their conclusions. The protective effect of living at higher altitude on coronary heart disease and stroke mortality was consistent and became stronger after adjustment for potential confounders. Being born at high altitude had an additional and independent beneficial effect on coronary heart disease mortality. Next, living at elevation also reduces your risk of cancer, diabetes, and all cause death. So dying from anything, the higher you live, the less likely you are to die from any disease. It also reduces your risk of cancer and diabetes. So once again, let's go over one of these studies. I've chosen an interesting one from 2010. And this one's called Cancer Mortality in Six Lowest Versus Six Highest Elevation Jurisdictions in the United States. And the study reads, low levels of background radiation exist around us continuously. These levels increase with increasing land elevation, allowing a comparison of low elevations to high elevations in regard to an outcome such as cancer death rates. The present study compares archived cancer mortality rates in six low versus six high elevation jurisdictions. The study also compares mortality rates for all causes, heart disease, and diabetes in low versus high elevation jurisdictions in an effort to see if other mortality outcomes are different in low versus high elevations. Statistically significant decreases in mortality with very large effect sizes were observed in high land elevation for three of the four outcomes, including cancer. 
One possible explanation for the decreased mortality in high elevation jurisdictions is radiation hormesis. So now we're onto the part where they're hypothesizing the cause of these beneficial effects from elevation. And radiation hormesis, the idea is that a little bit of this radiation, which is poison to all your cells, is going to benefit you. It's kind of like the whole vaccine theory that if you inject poison, that you're going to benefit from it. Another possible explanation, at least in the case of heart disease mortality, is the physiologic responses that accompany higher elevations regarding decreased oxygen levels. Ding, ding, ding. Now that's what we're talking about here. That is where I'm coming from with this. And I'll show you why and uh, why that's a lot more likely the factor that is causing the benefits of elevation. And also this study included a graph that came with it as well. So if you're watching the video version of this, as opposed to the podcast, you can see on the screen now mortality and low versus high elevations and in this graph you can see the mortality rate from all causes heart cancer and diabetes were all lower at elevation the higher you go now there's another question now, now that we're on the subject of cancer what if somebody already has cancer and they go up to elevation well there's an interesting study in rats dr ray pete mentioned this one and it was a russian study and essentially they induced cancer in the rats and simply by moving them up to elevation for a period of time, 50% of the rats healed without any other medical interventions. So the elevation itself, with ele without any other treatment, cured those rats of their cancer. Now, it's important to note that there are negative features of altitude, at least one that was alluded to in one of those studies by the scientists. And what they said was that the radiation at higher altitudes the low level ionizing radiation which is the ultraviolet b portion of the spectrum of radiation that comes from the sun the uvb is more intense at high altitudes you could also call call this cosmic radiation so in theory you would think that as you ascend to a higher altitude that you would have increased negative effects from this increased intensity of low level ionizing radiation and people like Linus Pauling, who are really critical of routine x-rays and the low-level ionizing radiation that people would get from them, he thought when the studies came out that showed beneficial effects of living at altitude, because of the increased intensity of the cosmic radiation, he thought there must have been an error in the studies. But in reality, there's an explanation for this. The idea is at higher intensity, the radiation ends up going right through you without causing much damage. Whereas when you're at sea level, the radiation is going slower, it stops in your cells, and it's able to cause a lot more damage. And this concept is called linear energy transfer. Living at altitudes gives you a longer lifespan. We do have some evidence for this as well. Dr. Ray Pete brings up that in the 1950s, a 187-year-old Peruvian man came down from the mountains in Peru to tour the U.S. as an oddity. After a couple weeks of visiting, he was sent back to Peru, and it turns out he died shortly afterwards. So the, the factors that existed in the environment at elevation, in the absence of those, he quickly died. And it was those factors that were keeping him alive and that kept him alive for so long. Uh, another interesting thing to note is that a lot of people mention the Hunza people, which is a tribe of natives that lived in northern Pakistan. And they are credited for living long and healthy lives. Uh, they, their diets contain mostly nuts, fruit, seeds, and yogurt. But the thing that people don't talk about, and this is why I bring up the Hunza, is because there's another factor, and that's the fact that they live at an altitude of 2,500 meters. It's a fairly high altitude. And so people don't, most people don't realize when they talk about the Hunza that that is a large and very important factor in their longevity and health. Now, the question is, how does it work when you are at elevation? How does, what are these benefits and how are they being imparted to you? So this is very interesting. Now you got to understand what's happening in the body. This is critical and it'll change the way you think of health and some other things as well. So essentially when you're at elevation, the atmospheric conditions are different in that the oxygen pressure is reduced. So something called the Haldane effect is the key thing to understand. And so essentially when oxygen pressure is reduced, there is less oxygen pressure pushing the carbon dioxide out of your body. There's the exact same amount of oxygen in the air, but the pressure is reduced. And so your body ends up retaining more CO2. Another important thing in order to understand why increased carbon dioxide is important, you need to understand the Bohr effect. So essentially, 
oxygen is bound to your hemoglobin in your blood and that's how it travels through the body hemoglobin is also your red blood cells so oxygen sticks to your red blood cells and that is how it's transported through your capillaries your veins and your arteries and makes its way to your tissues however without carbon dioxide present your oxygen will not be liberated from the red blood cells and thus your tissues will not be able to use it it's carbon dioxide that triggers the release of oxygen from your red blood cells and allows your tissues to use it so the key message here with the Bohr effect is that without carbon dioxide in your body and if you have a deficiency of it you can't use oxygen so at elevation you have increased carbon dioxide which means more efficient use of oxygen in the body and not surprisingly people like Tito Ortiz and many other professional athletes have been training in elevation the carbon dioxide essentially prevents the production of lactate or lactic acid in the body and that's why for athletes it is such a benefit because increasing the efficiency of the use of oxygen inhibits lactate production and thus increases muscular strength muscular endurance recovery time all these things so I found a, I found a quote actually from activerain.com in 2009 about this it's not uncommon to be driving to work and see sugar Shane Mosley jogging in the snow beside the boulevard boxers first started training up here full-time in the late 90s Oscar de la Hoya in particular at one time Oscar Fernando Vargas and sugar Shane all owned homes in Big Bear Lake Oscar recently sold his estate to former lightweight champion of the world Tito Ortiz even more than boxers MMA fighters have been training here in droves in the past year alone I have seen or met Quentin Rampage Jackson Tito Ortiz Joe Daddy Stevenson Cub Swanson Michael Bisbing Matt Hamill Cheat Congo Justin Levins Tyson Griffin Gray Maynard and Josh Berkman a few of them have even been gracious enough to do free seminars at the karate school I attend so all of these professional athletes are benefiting from the increased carbon dioxide in the body that is afforded to them by training at altitude many of you may know Michael Phelps American gold medal Olympic swimmer Michael Phelps he's been known for sleeping in his elevation tent which surrounds his bed so if you're looking at the screen now and you're watching this presentation on video on the screen you see a photo of his bed inside a chamber so this is an airtight chamber it's got plexiglass so you can see in and you can, he can see out as well uh, but it's an airtight chamber surrounding his bed a big box essentially and in here you'll see this device down here and this is what essentially removes or reduces the oxygen pressure in the air inside this chamber so he goes in at night sleeps in there for who knows 8 to 12 hours perhaps in conditions that create that mimic the same atmospheric conditions as being at altitude and as you can see in his swimming he is a gold medal Olympic champion and that probably had a lot to do with it now I just wanted to share my experience with this I uh, I had access to what is called a carbogen generator so essentially you hook a co2 tank up to this generator so the co2 comes in and you can set it to what percent you want so it was a mixture of air with supplemental co2 in there and I set it to 5% co2 by ele elevating the amount of co2 in the air I was breathing through the medical mask so that mimics what these guys are doing as well by training at elevation or sleeping in an altitude chamber and so I'm also an avid rollerblader after supplementing with carbogen for about 10 minutes at 5% co2 I went for a rollerblade in Toronto along the water on Lakeshore I rollerblade quite often so I know my limitations I know my what I'm capable of so it was really interesting to compare the results of what happened after consuming carbogen and what ended up happening was pretty incredible I, uh, I ended up sprinting on my rollerblades for about 10 miles not having to slow down at all like I literally kept like it felt like I kept accelerating the entire way and the most amazing thing was by the end of it I didn't even have to breathe heavy at all like I was breathing calmly through my nose never at any point that was the difference between normal normally when I rollerblade and when I used carbogen before normally by the end if I did that I would be breathing heavy through my mouth but this time there was no need at all to breathe through my mouth or breathe heavy at all so it was like pure nose breathing I didn't basically didn't exhaust it was incredible now if you ever have mountain sickness I wanted to bring this subject up because it's pretty fascinating so if you have mountain sickness and you go to your doctor they will prescribe you something called acetazolamide this is an incredible drug so acetazolamide works by inhibiting an enzyme 
called carbonic anhydrase. And that prevents, that enzyme normally triggers the breakdown of carbon dioxide in the body. So essentially by inhibiting that enzyme, it allows your body to retain more CO2. So what mountain sickness is, is essentially your body failing to retain more CO2 despite the decreased oxygen pressure. So this drug will allow you to retain more CO2 and overcome your mountain sickness. That being said, there are other ways to overcome mountain sickness. On the screen now you see a brown paper bag. Putting that up to your mouth, breathing in the bag and rebreathing your CO2 is another way to treat mountain sickness. If you're a mountaineer, I think the main way that they treat that now so if you, you're climbing a mountain and you get mountain sickness i think one of the main ways even today that they use to treat it is to get you to climb into a bag filled with oxygen but obviously from what we've learned here is that what you need is co2 so how does this bag work well when you're in there and you're breathing as you breathe you're increasing the co2 content in that bag and then eventually it works so a much more efficient way of doing that would be bag breathing or acetazolamide and I suspect if you ask your doctor why acetazolamide works, they would not be able to tell you. Now, in the interest of keeping this information practical, I wanted to figure out exactly how high you need to go to get the benefits of elevation. In case you want to move to a certain elevation in light of this information or go vacationing at a certain elevation. So one of the studies we mentioned before, and there's another one that we haven't, and they will give us some insight as far as how high you need to go to get these benefits. In a 2009 Swiss study involving 1.64 million people that we went over before, that study found that the benefits of altitude begin at an elevation of about 900 meters, and that for every 1,000 meter increase in elevation, mortality from heart disease decreases by 22%, and mortality from stroke decreases by 12%. Another study by San Francisco and Philadelphian researchers reported a 12.7% drop in the incidence of lung cancer for every 1,000 meter increase in elevation. So there you go. If you want to move to elevation somewhere, move to the mountains to gain the health benefits, you want to be at least 1,000 meters in elevation and the higher the better it seems if you want to just travel there for like a vacation we've got some information on that as well to see how how you can benefit from a short vacation or stay at elevation and how long the benefits might last once you come back down so a really interesting study that ray pete talks about is where they took rats to high altitude for two months so the rats were living and they were born at low altitude at sea level ish and they were taken to high elevation for two months and brought back down. And after they were brought back down for the remainder of their lives, and rats only live about 2.5 years, but for the remainder of their lives, they had double the mitochondria in their cells. So the mitochondria are the energy producing factories within cells. And if your body has sufficient energy to perform all of its vital functions, you're healthy. Having double mitochondria makes it a lot easier to produce adequate energy. So very, very interesting. Just two months at higher altitude, for the remainder of their lives gave those rats double the mitochondria in all their cells. In the interview I referred to earlier with Dr. Ray Pete, when he was asked how long the benefits of a one month vacation at high altitude would last, Pete replied about a year and a half. So there you have it. One month vacation at altitude can equal about 1.5 years benefit. As always, thank you for listening to this presentation. All my videos and presentations are and will be forever free. If you want to support my work, you can buy one of my books. I've got a book on red light therapy and two on cancer, one called The Cancer Industry and the other called Cancer, The Metabolic Disease Unraveled. All three books are bestsellers. I also sell red light therapy devices and all those things you can see as well as the show notes, graphs, and all the data and studies from this presentation by going to the show notes page on my website at endalldisease.com slash episode four. That's endalldisease.com slash E-P-I-S-O-D-E and the number four. Thank you for listening. Goodbye and God bless.